so excited that you're all here tonight on August 26th. You know, I have never really celebrated August 26th before. And it's and Liz Abzug was here, and it just feels right. It's just beyond me how Jane Latour wrote this book in only four years. In addition to everything else, she's got oral history interviews with 11 complicated women's lives. And she did that while she was also holding down a couple of jobs, including her regular editing chores over here at DC 37, uh, and heaven knows what all else. But she did do it, and it's a humper. I want to tell you, if you never pick up a blowtorch in your life, or never climb a fire ladder in your life, you will discover when you read this that you've been there. You will have what Melville calls the shock of recognition, because we all know what it's like to juggle the family, the kids, the job, the affirmative action, and the union. <laughs> Despite more than three decades of women working in skilled blue collar jobs, they're still few in number, very few in number. So this book, Sisters in the Brotherhoods, is an effort to explore the barriers that help keep it that way. Um, every chapter looks at a different barrier. So I have chapters on race discrimination, homophobia, um, corruption in the unions, lack of union democracy. Try to look at all those different barriers that um, are still present. Um, Sisters in the Brotherhoods looks at the brotherhoods, um, the unions as institutions, and the role they played as when women entered these traditional male spheres. And by and large, when it comes to affirmative action, the record shows um, 30 years of squandered opportunity. Now, after three decades, things are changing very slowly in the brotherhoods. The stories and sisters show that these women are terrific, forgive me, but poster girls for affirmative action. Um, their, the legacy of their contributions and their struggles demonstrate that when the opportunity is available, women have been able to succeed despite enormous odds. Uh, Joanne Jacobs enjoyed a full and satisfying career in the fire department. She's going to speak for herself eloquently and with great humor, but I want to set her up a little before she starts speaking. So I want to tell these people a little bit about you. And she went from being a firefighter, or as they all say, the best job in the world, to being a fire marshal. And she was a recruiter for the fire department, and she also served um, on a special program for fire prevention. And like the other women and sisters, she did it all not for herself alone. She continues to serve as a role model for young people. So I want to read a little bit about from the chapter. Well, um, as Jane said, I really enjoyed my time in the fire department. Um, I actually spent 18 and a half years as a firefighter. Um, the woman on the cover of the book, Brenda Berkman, um, initiated a lawsuit back in 1977, which uh, culminated in 45 women being hired by the fire department in uh, 1982. So, I guess she can be on the cover. <laughs> um, some of you know Brenda, so remember that I said that, right? Um, the beauty of her um, of the lawsuit and uh, was basically that Brenda wasn't the only one that went into the fire department. If it had been just Brenda, it would have been a totally different story. People would have still been thinking that women couldn't do the job. Um, and luckily, uh, 42 of us actually finished uh, the fire academy. Now, when I came in today, what's your name again? Latrice Davis. Yes. She asked me if I was the first black woman to be hired by the fire department or to become a firefighter. And one of the things that I was asked to talk about tonight was why it's important to have oral history. And an oral history can dispel that um, inaccuracy in terms of me being able to explain why you would think that I was the first black woman, but in reality, I came in with a group of uh, 10 black women uh, and one Hispanic woman and the rest Caucasians. And the way that that worked was that uh, as a result of the lawsuit, fire department was required to devise a new physical exam 
and only the women could take it because the fire department's union, um, the firefighters union, told the male candidates not to be a part of the class action lawsuit. So Brenda initiated the lawsuit on behalf of the class of women. And that uh, caused the, the UFA, the firefighters union, as well as the city of New York um, to claim that women had taken an easier test. So you had 45 women that went into the New York City Fire Department um, after taking an easier test. And subsequently, in the six weeks that we were in the fire academy, only 11 women were uh, allowed to graduate in the first graduating class. Because there was so much media attention, on um, November 25th when the women were uh, going to graduate with the class of men, the fire department arbitrarily decided, well, we're only going to let a few of the women out. And then, um, so 11 of us were able to graduate when the media was present, when the newspapers were taking pictures, when, uh, you know, all the notoriety took place. And then two days later, uh, another group of women and men, because they had to hold back some people, they couldn't just hold back women. So for the first time in fire department history, they actually held back men. Uh, two days after we graduated, then they let out another group quietly. And by then, the damage was done. It was appeared that out of 42 women, only 11 were really capable of doing the job. In any case, they let me out, and I went to the firehouse, and the men wanted to know, well, what happened? How come, you know, you, you were only one of a few girls that, now, I didn't want to be called girl then, but now, you know, 30 years later, um, <laughs> you were one of the only girls that got out. Well, you must have had a good attitude. Um, I had a BA in sociology, so it was, oh, well, you have a degree in sociology, you know how to act. Um, <laughs> I play tennis, so you're good in sports. And so for about a month, you know, they were patting me on the back, I had a good attitude, I was strong, I was fit. And then I realized slowly that in them patting me on the back and me allowing it, I was um, negating the, the efforts of the women that came behind me or you know, two days, three days, a week later. And so I started to explain to them the politics behind it, that I had worked with Lois Mungay, who was in my squad, and Lois could bench press, you know, 200 pounds. <laughs> she could do, you know, 400 sit-ups and 30 chin-ups, you know. Um, so I let them, I, I had to make them realize, to my own detriment, because now I was no longer the Amazon, um, that there were women that came behind me that were equally deserving, but because of the atmosphere and the attitudes of the times, they weren't able to uh, graduate with the notoriety.